Hi, this is Brian O'Hare, and on a beautiful day, summer day, May 21st, 2009. Pep Parade was last week, very, very successful. It's always good to see that parade because they get more people at the parade than they do at the voting booths. Of course, these people are too young to vote, most of them, but boy, do they have a good time. The Memorial Day Parade is next week, and uh, we honor our veterans on Memorial Day of all the wars since the beginning. And we do have some revolutionary soldiers buried in the Danbury Quarter Cemetery. Seven or eight of them down there, I think. And uh, they are taking better care of that cemetery now, thanks to the town uh, people who uh, keep the road in good shape and the cemetery pretty clean. Still a lot of work to do to restore it, but that's uh, not their problem. Other people are going to have to take care of that, the town historian and, and uh, his team. And next week, we have the referendum on Wednesday between 8 and 8 at the Pearson Middle School. I'll talk a bit about that when I go through the program. Tonight I am displaying pictures of the meager pickings that we, lo uh, we longer-term lake residents expected from the bottoms-up exercise. I mentioned a bit about that in my song. At Highland Lake last Saturday, together with some obvious refuse from the after-dive lunch. When you see the pictures, you'll see some paper plates in there. You'll see some tin cans in there and other refuse from the uh, lunch for all the supporters and volunteers and divers and whoever went to that lunch. And uh, it was held right there at the parking lot uh, near, the, uh, near the beach on First Bay. And um, it's hard to tell where the refuse from the dive leaves off and the refuse from the dinner begins. As I said in my song last week, we often find tires, cans, bottles and such, but otherwise not very much. There was one tire that won the prize for the largest find. The newspapers had fun with that. I believe cans, bottles, a few deck chairs, and some other rubbish will be seen in these pictures. Altogether, not very much consequence as expected. How do we analysts know? By talking to the various divers year after year after year. Whenever I see a diver, that's the first question I ask. How much junk is down on the bottom of the lake? And the first answer I always get is, not much. Most of it's been cleaned up one way or the other. Of course, there will be some. There's anchors down there and things that people, people use the, you know, Lawnmower engines as anchors, they use cement as anchors, they, they use all kinds of things as anchors, so you never know what you're going to get there. I think, I don't know if they found an anchor or not, but uh, anyway, I took these pictures early on the, um, Sunday morning um, and uh, thought I'd share them with you tonight. Well, all in all, it was a safe day. That's what the song was about last week, a safe day. There was plenty of support up there. 
should they need it, uh, which thank God I don't think they did need it. And no news is good news on such occasions because people are safe and we didn't find much junk and that's good because that means the, la the lake is clean down there. Now we don't know about the whole lake because we only did a little part of it, four hours, 12 or 13 divers isn't going to do the whole lake. Uh, so over a long period of time, they'll probably look at other parts of the lake, and uh, maybe they'll find a little more, or maybe they won't. Tonight, I will be displaying a lot, of got a, a lot of good news tonight from the town management perspective. So I'm going to go over it with you. It's going to take most of the program. I will be displaying the photograph of the town manager, Keith J. Robbins, who was once again this week given a vote of confidence by the selectmen in his recent evaluation. This makes three positive evaluations to date for the town manager, Keith J. Robbins. There was one absence during this meeting. Selectman Berlinski wasn't there. He had an excused absence. And one dissenting opinion for language reasons concerning the announcement but not because of dissatisfaction with the town manager's performance. The first vote of confidence was his unanimous selection over several other candidates for the job by all seven selectmen, including the minority selectmen, Republicans and Democrats alike. After they each reviewed his background compared him to the other candidates and felt very comfortable with his experience, education, qualifications, and ability to do the work. The second vote of confidence was his mid-year evaluation, another unanimous vote of confidence by all seven selectmen, including minority, Republicans and Democrats alike, but no dissenting opinions. The third and most recent vote of confidence is the latest evaluation announced during Monday's Board of Selectmen meeting after a 75-minute executive session. Executive sessions are closed to the public, and as a result, no information about the discussions is available at this time. Mayor Kenneth J. Fracasso read a statement after the executive session that the board agreed the town manager had done a satisfactory job so far. Since no one is perfect and all need feedback, the board also made some recommendations for job improvement that are customary in evaluations of personnel. These recommendations have not been released to the public to date. The vote was five to one. There were only six members there because one had an approved absence. With one member absent and the two minority members joining three of the majority members present in the vote. Selectman Aham, a member of the majority, was reported as dissenting <coughs> <pardon me, coughs> because he didn't agree with the language of the statement. Selectman Aham didn't think the wording indicated strongly enough that the town manager was doing a very good job. The town manager has taken on a tremendous challenge in a town during difficult times in a town not known for stable and consistent government over many, many years. Remember, we've had terrible turnover in town managers just in the last 10 years. And four or five town managers in the last 10 years. was ridiculous, really. Every time we change philosophy, we switch from a, a Republican uh, philosophy to a Democratic philosophy and back again, we seem to change town managers. The town manager has done well, despite inheriting some very challenging problems, and will continue to do so if given the support of all seven selectmen and their supporters.
Keep up the good work, Keith. The last time that we need, the last thing that we need is a change in the majority of the selectmen or the town manager during these very difficult economic times. And these very difficult economic times are projected, as you know from my upwards pressure chart over the last few weeks, is projected to be for a few more years. And we're going to have tough times here for a while. We all know that there have been a few but very vocal critics of Keith during his first difficult year in office. I don't agree with these critics, and I treat the town manager like I have the previous three town managers with respect. I like to think that I have had good relationships with all three of the previous town managers, even though they have all been quite different and we didn't always agree on issues. I always take the time to research and understand their problems and attempt to help where I can without attempts at micromanaging the town manager. The minority and their supporters would be better off if they did the same thing. Sometimes I think that there is too much micromanagement of this town manager attempted by the minority selectmen and their very small but vocal organization of supporters. By watching their actions, many have told me in the town, uh, when I see them on the street around town, many have told me that by watching their actions, it's easy to believe that they may be more interested in building a case for eliminating the town manager if, by some miracle, they gain a majority in the November 2009 election. That would not be good, because that would be yet another change in town managers, and we don't need that at this time. So think very carefully about that. Watch all these things. Uh, read the papers. Watch these things on TV if you have Channel 13, and uh, go to the meetings if you don't have Channel 13, and and uh, view these shenanigans and, uh, and then remember them at election time. Don't let this happen. Keep the balance the way it is for another term. This group is doing very well under circumstances, uh, under the circumstances and we don't need a change in philosophy in midstream. And as I said on my program a long time ago, Ted Williams batted 400, not 1,000. And we didn't want to fire Ted Williams every year because he didn't bat 500. We were thankful that he batted 400. And we have to be, look at the good things this town manager is doing. We have to consider the source when people start to criticize him. Now, I'm not saying he's perfect. Nobody's perfect. None of us are perfect. It's very important for businessmen to, rea uh, businessmen to realize. Not all their customers are perfect. Not all their employees are perfect because there are no perfect people. Think of how much better the town manager, Keith J. Robbins, could do if everyone was trying to help him instead of some trying to set him up or catch him out. The next subject I want to discuss tonight is when Joyce and I took our trip to Maine last weekend to visit our relatives for Mother's Day, Joyce immediately twisted her knee. And after a late night visit to the hospital in Maine for attention and x-rays, she was using a wheelchair for a few days, crutches, a walker, and a cane under difficult and different circumstances for a few days. Joyce commented to me about her appreciation for the accommodations that people and places made for the disabled in their entrances, washrooms, etc. When, you when you're not disabled, you don't really always notice these things. The hotel lent us a collapsible wheelchair and an adjustable walker that they had for the convenience of their guests. The local drugstores in the area 
would let you have use of their supply of crutches, wheelchairs, walkers, and such to tie you over until you returned home. I also purchased some various uh, uh, compress packs and uh, uh, things and an adjustable cane to use until we returned home. So we made it through that weekend. Tonight, as a coincidence, we will be discussing the American Disabilities Act, ADA changes being made to the Pearson School a work, uh, as a work will shortly be underway. Talk a bit about that tonight. The third subject for tonight will again be the town minority shepherds crying wolf about the possible end of volunteerism in Winstead. I talked about it last week. I'm going to talk about it part two this week. Comments were made concerning volunteerism by the chairman of the Democratic Town Committee from a prepared text during the public comment section of last selectman meeting. As a result, the reporter from the Republican American made a trip to the town hall and published an article in yesterday's paper, May 20th, 2009. That pretty much substantiated the presentation that I made on this program last week about the balance between the parties in town considering the appointment and reappointment of volunteers. I'll show you his numbers and comments tonight, and you can compare them, and I'll also compare them to mine. You can do the same thing. So I thank the Republican American, and even when Jim Moore was there before he stopped covering our town, I, I always thought he was very good at numbers and doing numerical re research about the budgets and all the other numbers uh, type issues in town. It looks like the new replacement is doing just as well. I know when Jim left, I shook his hand and said, Jim, you've always were excellent with your numbers. And that's all I really watch a lot. I manage uh, by objectives, so numbers are very important to me. Have a nice weekend and attend the Memorial Day Parade. Parades are something done very well in Winston. But don't expect any pets. That was last week in the pet parade. Joe, Jay Budahazy, I think, took some pictures of the pet parade, and you can see them on Channel 13 from time to time whenever they show them. No one deserves a parade and remembrance more than the past and present veterans. All the way back to the Revo uh, Revolutionary War. Thanks are due to all of them from all of us. On Monday, I will be thinking of my great-grandfather, William McGrain who enlisted under age in the Union Army and is a veteran of the Civil War and is buried in Winston today with a rebel bullet in his leg. And I will also be thinking of Joe Rizzi, the local Vietnam veteran who many years later, when he inherited the property on the lake from his mother and father, due to a change in the rules, couldn't get permission to replace a dock on Highland Lake that his mother and father had used for many years. I think I said, Joe faced death many times while crawling through the jungles of Vietnam during the war and many years later couldn't replace the dock 
that his mom and dad had on Highland Lake for many years. There was a rule change in the middle, and Joe got caught up in that. But anyway, thank you, Joe, for your service. Now I'll go to the agenda and just show you quickly what I'm going to go over tonight. I made my comments. The town budget, fiscal year 2009-2010 update. That's very simple. I'm just going to talk about the referendum again. Then I'm going to talk a bit about how to tie a shoe and how different people from different walks of life approach things like tying a shoe. Now tying a shoe here is just an example, allegorical, and it applies to a lot of things and I think I'll talk a bit about that when I talk about tying a shoe. You should see a picture of someone tying their shoe for at least a little while. I was going to bring a shoe here with me that had laces and I forgot it at the house so I can't, I don't have my prop but we'll do it anyway. The next is talking about the Pearson OCR progress. Quite a bit about that tonight. That's very, very good news. And then we're going to talk part two, the cry of the shepherds. The cry of volunteerism, volunteerism, volunteerism is on its deathbed type thing, which is not, of course, true. So here we go. The first thing I want to show you is the 209-210 budget. There will be a zero tax increase if approved at the referendum by the voters. And I encourage you all to get out and vote, one way or the other, whatever your preference is. The annual town budget referendum is Wednesday, May 27th, 2009, 8 a.m to 8 p.m. at the Pearson Middle School. So please attend, rain or shine, vote in this election. And uh, you know, we just had a big election in California yesterday where they tried to raise taxes and they got defeated and they have to cut their budget by $20 billion. We're kind of lucky here, most of the budget cutting has been done there are groups that don't want to pass the budget because they don't think the cuts were made in the right place. That's their own prerogative. Everybody, everybody thinks different. We'll talk a bit about that when we talk about tying a shoe. The next subject will be, guess what? Tying a shoe. And the first thing I want to talk about is the normal, distribu normal distribution curve for learning to tie a shoe. The normal distribution curve is the same normal distribution curve I use for all my examples. And this is the normal distribution curve, sometimes called the bell curve. The average is uh, somewhere up in here. And at this time, for this example, on the right-hand side, I put business experience people and there are all kinds of business, business experience people, those from who sell door to door, uh, life insurance or something, and collect week to week. There's those who have mom and pop stores. There's those that have shopping centers. There's those that own factories. And uh, there's uh, those that run big companies. So there's all kinds of shades of business experience. And to a certain extent, we all have some business experience uh, just running our household budget. Uh, some have more complexity there than others. And then on the left-hand side over here is what I consider all the people with the opposite types of experience. I've talked about this many times on the show. They're bureaucratic experience people, people who grow up during their working career in bureaucracies. For example, schools. Teaching in schools where they have the strongest union in the country. They have tenure for most of the people one way or another. They don't have too much fear of getting laid off. They get their raises pretty, uh, pretty uh, much guaranteed over time. I can't say they won't. Um, they won't get to a certain point where um, the, ra the, the raises uh, won't happen for a year or so or two, and they get their benefits, and they, they don't pay too much towards their benefits in most cases. So, and then that goes for the state. That goes for the U.S. government, and to a very minor extent our own town or any other town. 
So those are people. Now there are also other bureaucratic experiences. That's the large companies that are protected by monopoly. And they usually, like in the old days, you would see huge telephone companies, and to a certain extent still is, and uh, companies like that that are protected by uh, monopolies. They tend to become very bureaucratic because they have an umbrella over them uh, of protection. And they're not really competitive as these people would be over here. So there's all shades of these kind of bureaucratic experienced people. And again, they go from small bureaucracies, tiny bureaucracies, uh, major bureaucracies, and huge bureaucracies. And of course, the biggest bureaucratic uh, government we have is down in Washington, D.C. So, uh, hey, but our bureaucratic government in Washington is nowhere near as bureaucratic as some other countries in this world. So, um, you know, everything is relative. And that's why I'm displaying this distribution curve. So, tonight we're going to be talking about tying a shoe. And if I went to the people on the right hand side that have business experience, especially of those who have or hand-to-mouth people that have to sell some things in their store today to be able to eat tomorrow. And I say, i like to t teach you how to tie a shoe. They would say to me immediately, you don't have to teach me how to tie a shoe. I know what you do. You get the shoe, and you put the laces through the holes, and then you tighten it up around your foot, and you tie a little bow or a knot or something on the top of it. That's how you tie a shoe. You don't have to teach me how to tie a shoe. So it's a very straightforward, simple approach to solving the problem of tying a shoe. Now I'm going to go to the other end of the normal distribution curve, where you have educators and all kinds of bureaucratic people from bureaucracies, and we have plenty of them around that are even retired from bureaucracies. And you say, I'd like to teach you how to tie a shoe. The first thing they would say to you is, wait a minute, we need a procedure for that. We can't tie a shoe without having a procedure. And in that procedure, we need to have every step for how to tie the shoe. And in order to come up with that procedure, we need to have a commission of at least 20, maybe 30 people to decide what this procedure will be. And these 20 or 30 people must come from all walks of life, and they must meet once a month for the next year or so to come up with this procedure for how to tie a shoe. And we have to make sure that the procedure set uh, uh, caters for things like Velcro, where you don't have to tie your shoe which is to have to zip things together. Now, if you look at the normal distribution curve, if you ask, the average people will fall in the middle when you ask them about tying a shoe. And uh, the extremists will be over here that want the most regulation on how to tie a shoe. The people on this side will want the least regulation and more common sense applied in a different approach. So you can take any problem that we have in the town, and you can use that analogy. You can see it on television when the selectmen raise a point, the people on this side, the Republicans, will, will try to come up with a simple, straightforward, low-cost answer. The people on this side and their supporters will immediately start talking about not getting money, but spending money and instituting all kinds of procedures before you do anything, and having committees to define those procedures, and taking a long time to do it. People on this side seem to think that things should take a long time, and you should go slowly. I've had people at the lake tell me, Brian, we have to make change over 20 years very slowly and go in a certain direction. On this side, they want to make change faster, and they want to try to keep pace with the needs of the town. So that's why last week I sang a song that I think the minority needs to understand the needs of the town. 
and pay attention to them. The needs of the town are not to create more bureaucracy and not to spend a lot more money. The needs of the town are to have less bureaucracy and earn more money so that we can then take and spend it on things. Now that's a difference in philosophy. That's everywhere in the world. That's in every country, in every state, in every town, in every city. We are not unique in that respect. We are unique in the fact that we're poor and we have uh, um, a lot of problems in town that need to be resolved and we don't have enough money to do so. So it's, it's any problem you can imagine and the volunteerism falls in the same category. Uh, trying to set up the town manager if that's what's happening and I'm not sure it is or isn't, we'll find out after the election. Um, that falls, you know, these, a lot of people here don't want to change town managers, a lot of people over here might want to for very insignificant reasons, uh, and, uh, and then the rest of the people in town will fall along that normal distribution curve. So if you were sitting here and you were asking me, what about this problem, Brian? What about that problem, Brian? Well, they all fall along the normal distribution curve, and you have, everybody has a, a different way and a different uh, approach to the problem, just like the example of tying a shoe. Okay, now I'm going to move to another subject. Now remember, this is uh, part of the planning for success. You have to realize that this is happening, and you don't want to be changing your whole life because there's a few people down here screaming and yelling, and you don't want to be changing your whole life because there's a couple streamers on this side screaming and yelling. You want to pay attention more to what's happening here, and that most people realize that no one's perfect, that's for sure. But sometimes people act as though people should be perfect. And if you act that way, you're, you're looking for the Holy Grail because it doesn't exist. Well, maybe the Holy Grail exists. We haven't found it yet. But basically, um, you're not going to find the perfect person on this earth, I don't think. Okay, now, as far as uh, Pearson is concerned, this is great news tonight. I'm going to go through a bit of uh, the history here too tonight. Um, I think I got my slides out of order so I'm just going to look down through here a minute and then I'll be back with you. Okay, well we'll start out with this. Pearson OCR complaint remedia uh, remediation. The great news is that contracts are being signed as we speak. The work will begin, if all goes according to plan, on June 25th. And even better news is that the bids were substantially less than expected. The school building committee had estimated that the job would cost about $600,000. And that's what they were planning on. 70% coming from the state and 30% from the town of Winchester. But they're negotiating a contract now with a low bidder that will only cost us $281,000 instead of the $600,000 up here. Now there are a couple of things I want to talk about tonight that may affect this, but right now as we stand, it's $600,000 was what we thought it was going to be before we went out for bid. The contract is being negotiated for $281,000. So less than half of what we thought it would cost, and part of that becomes because of the economy. Because of our economy now, people are more hungry to do the work and get the jobs. So they're putting in lower bids, and of course it's our responsibility to make sure they don't have lesser quality as well, so the quality has to remain high. Now this may help the fund balance projections a little over the years, because we won't be, have to take so much out of the fund balance for this. And the thir there were 13 bidders for this work. 13 people bid on doing this work on the Pearson OCR uh, work. New Britons 
Scope Construction was the low bidder from New Britain, Connecticut. This was approved by the School Building Committee at their April 23rd meeting. And it uh, was appointed by the majority right after the last election. So uh, the school building committee was appointed by the majority, the Republicans, right after the last election. And they certainly have done a good job here. They were hampered a little bit by uh, it took too long for us to get our budget approved, so they couldn't do it last, w last year. They're doing it this summer, and they're trying to get it done by the end of the summer. The range of bids was $280,900 to $433,000. And we're near the $600,000 that we thought it was going to cost. The so $280,900 will only stand true if no other ADA work surfaces at the Pearson School over the next few months. If more work does surface for ADA uh, work, it will probably be done in a manner that will take advantage of the 70% reimbursement opportunity. So one way or another, they may have to spend a little more than the 280900 if more ADA work pops up. But that'll be to our advantage because we're already way under budget and um, we can get 70% uh, 70 matching. So let's hope no other ADA work pops up. But if it does, we seem to be in pretty good shape right now, unless it's a huge amount. So. Um, the work will probably be done in a manner that will take advantage of the 70% reimbursement opportunity. The 280900 will only stand if unexpected costs don't occur. For example, if you're doing a house, they always say to you up front, look, if we strike a ledge or if we, if we strike a spring of water while digging, then you're going to have to pay extra. We'll have to tell you when we get there. If you don't uh, strike it, then you don't have to pay any extra. It's almost impossible to tell whether it's there or not. Uh, so they always leave a hitch like this in there. So let's hope nothing pops up at the Pearson School that we don't know about while we're tearing things apart and reconstituting things up there over the summer. There are per day penalties, I understand, in the contract if certain dates are not being achieved. Remember, the objective of this period in OCR is to have it done before school starts again in the fall. So we'll start as soon as the uh, children are out of school and we're ready for it, and then we'll finish before they come back to school. That's the objective. Pearson needs to be completely free of activity on June 25th, 2009. Completely free. Can't have any children in the building, no teachers, no janitors, nothing. Must be empty. Now, there may be one little exception I don't know about, but as I understand it, they don't want anybody in the way. It's dangerous, and they'll retard things and slow things down, and they need to move along. They'll be working a lot of hours, and they'll have penalties if they don't achieve their goals. So needless to say, if we get in their way, then they don't have to pay the penalty, and we might have to pay more money to them. So that's that. So um, the Pearson School needs to be completely free of activity on June 25th in order for us to make our schedules. Asbestos abatement will then begin. And according to information I read about it, there are nine areas that are being abated. Following the asbestos abatement, a demolition team will remove concrete from the second floor bathroom to facilitate renovations. 
Now that's going to be a uh, pretty, pretty dirty, tough job. Remove all that concrete. And then the concrete will be removed via the stairway two trucks to be carted away or to whatever uh, method they're going to use to store this stuff and then cart it away. Materials are being purchased for delivery to the school to be placed in locked containers. So they're being ordered, that they'll be ordered pretty quick. They'll be delivered to the school to be placed in locked containers so that everything will be standing by when the work starts. This should help the project move faster when it begins because they won't have to wait for the delivery of certain critical path items. Can't say everything's going to get there, won't be perfect, nothing is. That's the 95% rule. Things will happen if planned properly 95% of the time and there will be 5% when things don't go as expected and you have to use manual by exception to manage that 5%. So you have to expect people and things not to be perfect. The tougher the job, the tougher it is, and the more you have to expect the problems. The ADA work will improve the access for handicapped students. That's the American Disabilities Act. So once the work's done, this will improve the access for handicapped students. The grant terms are the state reimbursement, I'm pretty sure it's the state, although they do deal a lot with people up in Massachusetts, and I don't exactly understand how that works, but state reimbursement, or whoever's going to reimburse us, will be 70%, and that'll be up to $420,000. Will be 30% or up to 180,000. Now that's for the $600,000 grant. If the work had cost 600,000, this is how it would break down. 70% would be 420,000. 30% would be 180,000. So if the $600,000 original estimate was true, remember that's the grant terms. This is the estimate. We're switching now from grant terms to estimate. The grant terms will remain until we're done. Should we go over budget a bit, we can still probably do all right on the grant terms if everything qualifies and we follow the procedures. We're dealing with bureaucrac bureaucracies here. There's a lot of procedures and a lot of protection on all this stuff, which costs money and slows us down, but also helps us, in this case, to do a good job. We're learning from other people's experience as far as this is concerned. If the 600000 original estimate was true, the town would pay 30% or $180,000. The state would pay 70% or $420,000. If the $281,000 contract amount uh, stands, the town will pay 30% or, or $84,300. That will come from the fund balance. It's in the budget. The state will pay 70% or $223,000. So if the contract numbers hold, this will be a $95,700 savings for the town. And a $223,300 savings for the state. Now, up until recently, we always thought the state money was free. But we're finding out now in this recession that it isn't free. It's hard to get. I always say on this program that we had to have a sword of Damocles hanging over our head. And that's the money we get from the state government about six million dollars a year and going down. When the state and the town both need it the most. So this is great news and I want to give a personal thanks to the dedicated, well-qualified 
and well-balanced school building committee for doing such a fine job and bringing in these numbers despite very difficult circumstances they are Jay Case he's a Republican and he's the chairman I put the affiliations on here because I want you to see that it's balanced we have Marshall Sterling who is unaffiliated we have Joseph Beadle who's a Democrat and he has a lot of knowledge about the town he's worked with the town for many many years and he has a lot of knowledge Marshall Sterling is very numerate and a good business person Jay Case is a little of both they grew up in this area numerate and a uh, business person and he has a lot of experience in the town he was a selectman Nicholas Mancini businessman Republican and Peter Marshan was excellent unaffiliated He's involved with the, uh, one of my favorite groups, the Winchester Fire Department. Boy, do they know how to manage a budget. They just brought a brand new fire truck, pretty sure it's new, um, and they didn't get a penny from the town. They did it all on raising money and getting grants and doing you know, stuff like that. So Peter Marchand and the rest of the team have done a wonderful job here, should be congratulated. If you see them, say thank you and um, let's keep them going through the next election because I think if we have another election and when we have the election if this same board of selectmen don't get reelected and some of them might not even run but and we've got to get keep the majority in control one way or another then you might see a, a big change in here off we go again uh, with a 20 person commission and uh, and uh, you know all kinds of procedures that will take two years to figure out and then yet another big large bond issue which we don't need this time in our growth and then our ex officio members that helped put all this together over the last year and a half and that's Kenneth Ricasso the mayor Patrick Haig director of public works Henry Centrella the finance director Blaze Salerno, the superintendent of K-8 through school system. And then I didn't put a name on here because John Torek was on here as an ex-official member, but he resigned from the uh, K-8 through uh, as their finance director, and they have a new finance director. And I don't know whether he's been actually put on this commission or not. So if I find out, I'll tell you. And then I want to say thanks to all the town residents from all affiliations that volunteered, volunteered over the last year and a half to support them, this commission, and a committee rather, and help them put this Republican campaign commitment on the, to the road of success. We don't want to see it crash around election time. Let's keep it going. Next year, I'm sure there'll be a, uh, uh, looking at another school and trying to bring that up to, up to snuff the following year to another school so if we keep all the schools we have and you know that's all in question now when the Republicans were running for office they, they ran on a platform that said uh, we don't agree with this 57 million dollar bond package for repairing buildings and replacing buildings in the town including the schools fire station police station town hall that kind of thing and it was 13 million dollars worth of interest in the uh, payments were going to go to the uh, um, the of that interest to uh, the taxpayers as well as for the principal for 20 years so these Republicans ran on a anti large bond issue platform and they won hands down five to two they couldn't get any more than five people in. that's all they were allowed so they won all five positions that were available to them and they immediately canceled the large bond package, thank God, now with the recession and everything, and they started this bond commission, which has done a wonderful job, and is still doing so. Uh, there are, is some opposition to the whole thing, but it, it is being pursued, and in, in, at the end of the summer, that Pearson work should be pretty well done. Now, we don't know what the future of Pearson is, because there's this whole issue about four schools, Gilbert and the uh, 3K through 8 uh, schools, that are underutilized. Do we really need four of them? That's the question that the Board of Education and the superintendents are looking at right now. We don't know the answer. So uh, we don't know 
which schools would survive, maybe all of them, maybe just two or three of them, nobody knows. But that will all be looked at over the next year or two. So who says that volunteerism is dead or dying? Who says that? Well, people over on the left-hand side, normal distribution curve, because that can be used to try to unsettle our local government and try to get them out of office next year. So perhaps we can replace the town manager and change into a more of a bureaucratic uh, method of running the town, which hasn't worked for us in the past and won't work for us in the future. We all know that volunteerism is here to stay. As I said last week, it's been around for 200 years. It'll be around for another 200 years. Now, I want to move on to the next and uh, last part of the program for the next five or six minutes, and that is the wolf cry of the shepherds. The end of volunteerism is near, which I don't agree with. It'll never end. You couldn't kill it if you wanted to. You can burn this town down. You can have another uh, 55 flood. You can suffocate everybody. But you will still have volunteerism grow from the ashes as it has over the last 200 years. Now, last week I went over some statistics for you. Everybody else talks what I would call um, po politically. I'm talking factually here. And some people say, well, Brian, you, you speak too much with numbers. Well, numbers are key to this whole thing. The numbers tell you the truth. So what I want to do here is I want to flip this, so when I put up this slide, you won't see all that like I did last week. <laughs> okay, this was what I put up for you last week. Basically says we had 100 appointments, reappointments, uh, or, um, not reappointments, not appoint, and one removal. So altogether, that was about 100. And we had 12 Republicans appointed which was 33% of the people put up. Democrats, 14, had more than the Republicans on the appoint-to-commission side. And on unaffiliated, we had 10. Most of them were in the uh, Laurel Queen area, but 28% there. And then independent party, zero. Now for reappointing, the Republicans had 15. So they had more than the Democrats in this column, less than the Democrats in this column. And I have in my numbers 15 or 37.5 percent, and 12 for the Democrats or 30 percent, and 11 or 27.5 percent for the unaffiliated, and then two for the independents, people listed as independents. And there were three people that were uh, the selectmen voted not to reappoint. One was a Democrat, one was a Republican, and one was unaffiliated. Now, how even can you get? One, one, one. That's e equal. Thirty-three and a half percent each of those three. And those three uh, are only three compared to 76 appointments. So it's a very, very small percentage. And then two that didn't get appointed. They didn't get off the starting gate. And then one that was removed, the Planning and Zoning Commission, and is now contesting that with the town. And that'll go on for quite a while, probably. And that's that. Now, when I said this last week, I said anybody wants to challenge these numbers, go down and look in the town hall and come back with some numbers. And if, there, I, if I, whatever numbers you come back with, I'll tell the people what they are. Well, the Republican American, after hearing the presentation by the chairman of the Democratic Town uh, Committee at the select meeting on Monday night, Republican American, um, wrote an article about this. What they did is they sent a reporter, the editor sent a reporter down to the town hall to do exactly the same thing that I did last week. So tonight I'm just going to show you what they found. The Republican American Appointments article was in the paper yesterday, dated May 20th, 2009. And the byline is Kurt Moffitt, who is the new uh, reporter for the Republican American, as I understand it, who replaced Jim Moore, who was here for, for a few years uh, before. The headline of the article, and you can get it in the, either library in the morgue, uh, they have all the old newspapers, Winston's board picks of commissioners, reappointments and appointments, show a split nearly even, which is exactly the same thing I found when I went down and, and did the numbers. And then in the article, the first paragraph said, 
a review of meeting minutes by the Republican American. They went down and went into the town clerk's office and looked at the, the records of the, uh, since the election of all the selectman meetings, gathered the information, and they found it indicated that the Republican majority, Board of Selectmen, since 2007, when they were elected, all seven of them, has appointed 30 Republicans and 26 Democrats to various boards and commissions. So they came up with pretty much the same numbers I did. I was off a little. I had, uh, I had the same number um, on the Democratic side, and I had uh, 26, and I had 27 on the Republican side, so if I have time, I'll go back and look at that. But uh, we're very close, close enough. Appointments by selectmen during this administration, Republican American, 30 Republicans, 26 Democrats. Planning for Success, which is this program, and I did the work, 27 Republicans and 26 Democrats. But I also listed all the unaffiliated and the, and the other things, which they don't have in their article. So to me, that's close enough for comfort. And again, no problem with volunteerism. I'm starting to look now at this report right here, which shows that um, this shows all the commissions in town. It's a report put out by the town. And I'm going through that now to find out how many vacancies there are on these commissions. I can tell you there won't be many. And I can also tell you there's always going to be some. Somebody's always going to be leaving town or quitting the commission or having to work extra hours, and that's going to happen. So I'm going through this now. I did an index, two indexes for it this week. I'm going to go through it next week. I'm going to bring all the information up to date, and then perhaps on the next program or the one after, I will go over this data with you. I already know what it's going to say. It's going to say we don't have too many vacant positions on these commissions. With that, I thank you. Have a nice Memorial Day. Think of the veterans, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>